Okay, it's time. Hello, welcome to the BOF. Uh, my name is Bartosz Golaszewski. I've been working with open source for 15 years professionally and I've been an amateur even before that. I maintain the GPIO subsystem in the kernel, I maintain a couple drivers and some user space pro project. I've contributed to many different things these days. I mostly do kernel, but uh, over the time I've done build systems, user space and whatnot. And I'm quite passionate about coding. I, I, I like software development. I am based in France, as you can tell by my typically French name. And uh, I work currently for the narrow. You can tell it from this angle. And I'm in the Qualcomm landing team. Uh, so yeah, that's it about me. And thank you to Linaro for having me here and getting me to work on interesting subjects. Check us out. We make uh, software run on ARM. And with that out of the way, if you have five hours and want to catch up on the issue, then this is a, a good starting point. So make sure to download the videos and watch them on your return flight home. The problem statement. So, oh yeah, and this is a buff, so don't be shy. Uh, please take the mic from Fabian. And uh, if you want to you know, get on stage with me and, uh, and uh, talk some more, that's, that's possible as well. Uh, do, do you want do you want to start changing? I, I don't it's think it's necessary. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay. okay. Problem statement. So, drivers, provider, resource provider, drivers in the kernel do often two things in probe. They will allocate some memory in probe that will be freed and removed, and they will register themselves with the provider subsystem, which can be. Can, can, can be visual, visualized like this. And what is the problem? The problem is that they allocate often struct device, which is reference counted, but they free the memory where it's stored in remove, but there's still, there, there can be still references held to that struct device. And some, system, some subsystems just crash, others have some workarounds, some get it right, most don't. And the solution is actually quite straightforward. Struct device must survive driver unbound, unbound. Or rather, the subsystem must be able to handle the provider data disappearing suddenly because the drivers can simply be unbound, unbound in, any, in any moment, especially if they are on dynamic buses, even um, indirectly, because you can have a driver that is never meant to or theoretically never meant to be unloaded, but it's on a dynamic bus a couple layers below, like an I2C adapter on a USB device. Why do we allocate those struct device uh, instances? Basically what we do, we often have this split between physical device representation and logical device representation. So in this in this case, we have a platform device or whatever device that will come up when the device is detected and, and, and probed, and it will create a logical device. So not a platform device, but for instance, an I2C device or a GPIO device that will be underneath one layer below. And this is what I refer to as a logical device where you can have two devices representing two GPIO banks on a single chip, which one layer above is represented as a single platform device. I've, no, I've noticed that uh, this is a major issue in the kernel. Well, I, I wasn't the first person to notice it, but uh, I, I started working on that. And uh, the first thing I wanted to fix was the GPIO subsystem because it suffered from, um, from simply crashing whenever, uh, whenever such, a, such a situation would, would appear that you would have a GPIO chip that is being used by someone and then the provider of that chip disappears. The user tries to use it, dangling pointers, bam. I think that there are several ways you can fix it and I like one especially, so I used it to address the, the, the issue in GPIO and I'm happy to announce that in uh, 6.9 this will no longer be a problem of the GPIO subsystem. The code has landed and right now the GPIO chips can handle 
or rather the GPIO subsystem can handle GPIO chips disappearing. I will first present the approach I used. I will present another one that seems to be popular among the people that fix subsystems uh, that, that exhibit that problem. I will talk another, uh, I, will, I, I will discuss another uh, third way of doing it. Then I will hopefully get, get some feedback on it and maybe possibly even, uh, um, even more approaches. And finally, if time permits, uh, I want to discuss device links. So I call my preferred solution the split responsibility, where what you do is you have your subsystem uh, that defines the implementation structure for the provider drivers. And what you have in that implementation structure, you have some data, you can have your name, you can have some callbacks that the, that the subsystem will call, use to call into the driver, some, some additional data, whatever. This is a very simple example with a simple callback and a name. What do you do? The provider drivers starts probing, it allocates this structure, it may be part of a, of a bigger driver structure if needed, but in this case uh, it allocates the structure, and then it registers with the subsystem. As you can tell, there is no struct device yet. It was not part of this implementation structure because what happens is that it's the subsystem that allocates struct device, and it's a private structure that the provider driver has no access to. So in GPIO parlance, this would be the split into struct GPIO chip and struct GPIO device. GPIO chip is something the driver allocates. GPIO device embeds struct device and is something that the subsystem allocates. The difference is that the former is, its lifetime is tied to the driver being bound to its device. For the, for, for the latter, it's reference counted because it embeds struct device and it uses struct device track devices KRF to count references. So what the subsystem does is it has the device structure which embeds, as I said, struct device and also holds a pointer to the implementation. And the pointer, as you can see, is protected with RCU. Why about that in a minute? So when you, from your provider driver, call into the subsystem, you go into the registration function, and what it does is it allocates memory for the device, initializes the internal device, and that's it. It will never free it. It will assign it a release callback using the device type structure. Why RCU? Because we, in this, we, we're using SRCUs, not, not RCU, but because we, we may want to sleep, so in, in this case, I, 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 I settled for SRCU. You can, whenever you go into the subsystem and you call a whatever API, you simply enter a, an SRCU read lock section. You dereference your implementation structure using the provided API, and then you can call your function, your driver implementation while still being in the read lock, uh, SRC read critical section. And then whenever your provider driver is being unregistered, what you do, you set the implementation pointer to null, and then you synchronize all SRCU uh, critical sections. This is what GPIO does right now. Every API function is inside the SRC critical section. They all can run in parallel, and they will get synchronized once the provider driver is removed so that we don't really null the pointer until the last critical section ended. Then we synchronize and then whenever a new API call comes in, it will see the pointer, the implementation pointer being null. It will run a check and then say, okay, no device, bam, I, uh, I return an error. Does it make sense? So this is, this is one approach. Another approach, and uh, this seems to be used, like I, I, I saw some patches for the PWM subsystem that, uh, that use that, it's a bit different. It tasks the provider driver with allocating memory for struct device, but instead it asks the provider driver to hand over any memory to the subsystem, not free it in remove. I don't like this approach, I will, I will say why. But first, how does it look like? So it looks like this. The subsystem gives us, again, a definition for a structure. Some callback in that structure, right? Um, you, 
we can we can we can put them in in a separate op structure. We have the name, we have the struct device embedded in that structure, and the callbacks. What does the provider driver do? It allocates the memory, but not with a generic kmalloc. Instead, it uses a, an interface provided by the subsystem. So in this case, the subsystem gives us bar alloc data. It's not a devm interface, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's pure, and there you will not see any, um, well, you, you have the bar free data, but it should not be used other than in error paths in probe. Instead, what you do, once you register your data with the subsystem, it's considered owned by the subsystem. The driver no longer controls it, so when the remove is called, the driver will not remove it. Instead, it will allow the subsystem to release it. Why don't I like it? So the, the argument for using that is because you, all, you, you only allocate once and not twice. Memory is so cheap, and you, this is not a hot path, this is a driver probe, it doesn't matter really. Instead, what you get is something that is, um, looks confusing because there is, in software, in coding in general, if you allocate something, you have to pair it with a free. If you allocate something and then hand over the ownership of that, it looks sketchy. Something's not right. You, 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 your, your internal static analyzer. Yeah, uh, Fabian, can, can you give, mic to, give the mic to Krzysztof? Your static analyzer in the brain will, will complain. It fits trust. You, you pass the ownership. <laughs> yeah, does it though? <laughs> can you tell which uh, subsystems use this model? So I, I recently saw patches for that for PWM, and there are I, I think uh, I'm not sure if Spy uses that. Uh, there are several. I I I, I, uh, I, I would need to check again, but uh, this is something that you often see like. Uh, full alloc data and the drivers will allocate that data using a provided interface instead of allocating it themselves. So it's, it's, it's definitely, I, I think this is more common than what I presented actually. What I presented used to, so what the, 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 the first solution used to be used by GPIO before, but it was wrong and it would crash. It's still wrong, for instance, in regulators. Uh, in, in, in certain instances it can still crash because there's no synchronization like uh, what I introduced with SRCU. So, uh, yeah, so these are the two main approaches. And then is, there's something that I call read-only config structure. This is something that, for instance, NVMEM uses, where you don't task the provider driver with holding any data. Instead, what it does in probe is it allocates some memory on the stack, which holds a config structure, and everything in that config structure will be deep copied by the, by the subsystem. So what the subsystem does is it takes the pointer during bar register, it copies all the data it needs, and then after, probe, after, after the, the, the function returns, that memory is, is irrelevant, it can go away. So uh, if you register an NVMEM device, you can have your NVMEM config, or if, you reg if you're registering a regmap, for instance, your, your config only needs to live for as long as the registration is happening. Once it's done, it, you, 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 can, you, can, you, can, you can dispose of it. So this is probably even, uh, even uh, a, a better approach, except that for GPIO it wasn't possible because we have so many drivers that would need to be converted that it doesn't make any sense. It's better to allow them to have the implementation structure embedded. So why am I talking about it? Because there is a lot of talk uh, recently about making sure that we can put all kinds of uh, devices that were not previously meant to be hot unpluggable on uh, devices that can in fact be unplugged at runtime. And uh, while yesterday we, we had a discussion about, uh, Im about the impact of that on device tree, on OF implementation, the kernel, I'm arguing that uh, without addressing the subsystems that cannot handle hot unplugs, we will not get it to work anyway. So this is why I, I wanted to discuss this one. So these are the three approaches that I've, uh, I've seen so far. The first one that I use personally are there any more? Are there any, are there any opinions on, on the three? Are there any uh, new ideas? Uh, what would you do to, to make sure that your non-dynamic devices can actually be put on dynamic buses? 
awesome. <laughs> Another thing that we uh, that we have. If you talk, for instance, to Saravana Kanan, he will tell you that all this is relevant because this should all be handled even before we probe with device links. So if you are familiar with device links, this is the whole mechanism that will allow us to enforce a probe order whenever you have resources that are requested by consumers. These consumers should never be probed before these resources are actually available in the provider drivers. And it's, in theory, this is awesome, but it doesn't really work all the time. For instance, I have posted an example on the mailing list of uh, using interrupt with GPIO interrupt controllers, where despite having device links set up, they will not work, they will not be enforced because uh, in the interrupt subsystem doesn't really, isn't really integrated well with the, with the driver model. So when you have a an inter, like when you have an interrupt controller getting uh, probed, it's it's not aware that it's tied to a certain GPIO device, and there, it's it's actually very easy to uh, with a device tree based system to uh, generate a situation where where you will have a, a a whole lot of stack traces from the interrupt subsystem if you unbind the GPIO controller, which is also an interrupt controller with interrupts requested by some users. If you unbind that GPIO uh, controller, if you request the GPIOs, then the device links will enforce the unbind of the users of those GPIOs. But if you request interrupts from that GPIO controller, this is in turn uh, orthogonal. So the, the, the actual GPIO controller doesn't even know about those interrupts being requested. So device links will not work. You will unbind the GPIO controller, bam, the, the the interrupts will still be requested, they will still dangle. It doesn't cause a crash uh, because of how interrupts are numbered, but it causes uh, a bunch of stack traces from, le it leaks memory in, in ProcFS and SysFS and, and, and does a bunch of other problems. So I, I tried to address it and uh, I got yelled at by Thomas Gleixner and then somewhat uh, figured out that I, I will leave it for now, but uh, probably should be revisited some, at some point. So yeah, so this is what I prepared to, uh, to start the discussion. So now, now we can discuss. Uh, uh, yeah, go on. So uh, my understanding of the topic is a bit limited, but uh, one overall question is, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, we, the relationship between various devices like the GPIO, which provides an interrupt, and the interrupt is used by some peripheral. Um, it is probed from the center for the CPU to the periphery. And then if, from the point of view of unloading, you unload from the periphery to the center. So in the practice, while the, pro the problem exists, uh, I think in many realistic cases, it won't happen if you consider loading and unloading of, of drivers. Um, of overlays, for example. Um, so the question is, uh, it, it happens, uh, yeah, it's easy to, to reproduce this sort of problem if you manually unbind the driver, uh, but does it even make sense to unbind the driver which is used? The, it, you, can, you can very easily reproduce it if you have like a GPIO, uh, like, during our discussion yesterday, I, I, meant, I, I mentioned the CP2112, the HID uh, expander with an I2C and, and uh, GPIO chips on board. If you plug it in, you get some devices. You can create those devices from user space over SysFS. You can request those GPIOs from user, user space. If you, plug it in, if, if you unplug it, you, you, you'll trigger those crashes, like not anymore with GPIO. With I2C, you will actually freeze the, one of the kernel threads that does the remove if you try to unplug it with uh, users still active. And uh, you don't need to, if, you, if, you, if you're limiting yourself to only devices probed from device tree, yes, device links will probably save you. But if you have anything else that is not covered by device links, then uh, you, will, you will easily trigger the problem. Not only with like a strictly theoretical uh, unbind over SysFS, like this is something that can happen 
th this is how I uh, noticed it. So just by, by you know, doing a manual unplug of a used device. So this is definitely something that, uh, that happens. And uh, there is uh, Brian in the back. If you could pass the mic, please. So I was just wondering, uh, Bart, uh, the, uh, your preferred solution, though, does it actually address the problem where you've uh, hooked an interrupt on a GPIO and then you, you, you would pull that USB device out? Does it not, does the device link? No. It, it's the same problem, right? It is the same problem. Uh, it doesn't cover it because the problem is in the interrupt subsystem and not in uh, GPIO. The, the, the problem here is that uh, what happens is you register a, an interrupt, uh, an IRC chip from the GPIO driver, and whenever this interrupt is requested with request IRC, so Thomas Gleitzner argues that users should have a way to be notified about the need to release or to free all interrupts. I'm arguing that it is not possible. Uh, like, w w how, how would you do that? Like, Device links are there to address that, but it doesn't work because the interrupt subsystem is not part of the driver model. So the device, device links in this case are wonky at best. Yeah. For interrupts, which is still an issue, yes. Um, yeah, so this is this is still something that needs addressing. Um, can you pass the mic to Krzysztof, please? Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, you ask for one more uh, solution. So I think the NFC subsystem uses uh, something like this regular buggy choice and just puts everywhere test bit whether the adapter was removed, adapter was unplugged, like things like that. So all such callbacks, which you know, uh, some provider in this framework calls something, always checks whether everything is running to avoid it. So but uh, is, it, is, it, is it within some uh, critical section? Is it locked? Because if you, no. check, the, if you check the bit and then proceed, exactly. then... No, 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 NFC is broken. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's spaghetti cut with uh, thousands of bugs and uh, syscaller uh, brings every month several you know, new bugs, mostly because um, someone added a virtual NFC device. So NFC is the, the near field, so a network device. So someone brought a virtual device, so you can test the NFC code on a virtual machine. So syscaller now is testing mm -hmm. and it's like in C, it's bringing, bringing issues. So, but they, the idea was that they solved the solution with test bit or test flag, which of course is obvious, uh, obviously wrong. It's not totally wrong. It, 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 it can be a solution and you don't even need a, a spe special test flag. What you can do, is uh, use the existing flags in struct device. Like struct device has uh, the um, K objects uh, in, I, I don't remember what, what it's called, but if you call device is registered, it will check a specific bit. The only thing that's left is just lock that state. So use, I don't know, um, read write semaphore. And uh, yes, but if device take, is being removed, the struct def is also being torn apart. No, you take a reference to it. Like if you're using it, then you should have taken a reference yeah, to yeah. it. Uh, so the solution is not entirely broken. I do that, so I uh, posted patches recently for a new subsystem, it's called uh, power sequencing subsystem. And what I do in, for, the, for those power sequencing devices is I uh, register them. I, I use an read-write semaphore and I, on every API call, I take the read lock, I check if that device is still registered, the provider, I do my uh, stuff still under the read lock, and then in the remove, I take the write lock, I unregister the device, I release the write lock so that you cannot have read sections at the same time doing anything. When they will you know, eventually be let in, they will see that the, the device has been unregistered and they will return. So it's an, I, I think it's a slightly easier than the SRCU solution. But uh, for, for GPIO, um, why did we use SRCU? Because GPIOs are complex and uh, well, how hard can it be, right? Uh, you, you can toggle GPIOs or read GPIOs from atomic context on from, or from process context. And the drivers on the other side can, be, can sleep or may never sleep because there, these may be MMIO or I2C drivers and you never know. 
So you have, you know, atomic context, process context, sleeping drivers, non-sleeping drivers, and neither spin locks nor semaphores or mutexes will work. So the only thing left is SRCU, which allows you to be called, like enter the read section from any context and also call whatever uh, functions, sleeping or non-sleeping functions uh, from those uh, read sections. Like, I would have used a, a read-write semaphore, but it was not possible because, uh, because of those complexities. Um, so yeah, the, the, to, to, to summarize, uh, checking a bit is not wrong, but you need to account for the state changing. Like if you just check the bit and go on and assume that it will not ch change, yeah. So I, I, I would, if I were to recommend something for the NFC, is just uh, use some kind of a fast lock and uh, read write. Do you got any feedback from other people on the mailing list for your uh, SRCU solution? Like I don't know. I got other feedback from Paul McKenney, the the author of uh, <laughs> SRCU, but he just he just you know he he reviewed the patches, so he said that. He doesn't know if the approach is uh, right, but the code looks right. Uh, so technically, it was it was uh, done right, but whether that's the best solution, like I, I think, I've asked that question several times. Like, does anyone have any better solution? Never heard a an, an alternative. So, I don't think there is an alternative. Like, if you have in other subsystems, sure. But if you have a subsystem that can be called from any context and can call into any context, then I don't see an alternative. In fact, I'm very happy that SRCU exists because regular RCU does not allow you to call sleeping functions in, w w within the read critical sections. So SRCU is the only one. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the only solution because for power sequencing, I'm not using it because you, you don't risk being called from atomic context. But in this case, it, it, it seemed to me that I cannot do it any other way. So do you uh, agree that this needs to be addressed before we even go into, into uh, OF implementation? Or yesterday you said that you want to uh, start with, with the final part before you, uh, <laughs> in order to justify the changes uh, to, to maintainers. Um, about over tree, uh, um, device tree removal, um, there are so many aspects. Uh, one is the device tree representation. Uh, one is uh, the removal itself, which triggers its own issues. And one is the various subsystems and drivers that are broken uh, if you remove uh, the, the overlays. So uh, I think, uh, we can start with an implementation of device tree removal once we have a, some agreement on how to describe all the stuff in, in device tree source. And then also fix some of the subsystem that need to. Because if we need to fix everything before everything gets merged, it's never gonna be done. So uh, we have, uh, in our case, we have, I don't know, five subsystems involved, okay, we, we need to fix those five, but there are other intents which are broken, okay. When someone needs to unload stuff with those subsystems, they will need to fix them. Otherwise, I don't think it's really doable. Do you, have you, have you looked at uh, what the issue is in I squared C? Uh, no. Okay, so uh, the short story is that uh, if you have, if you're removing uh, an I2C, Adapter, uh, sorry. No, I mean uh, to, to me person to me personally, like. Uh, In our use case, we don't. No, no, sure, sure, sure. Uh, that, that's that's fine. Uh, it's, it, I think it's, it's it's kind of it's kind of the point that Luca was was mentioning, right? We will want to solve the problems for the the cases that we have, and then if you have another case that because it's another problem, it's another thing that needs to be solved. But if you Sure, yeah, right. sure. So I, I, I wanted to make a, a different points. I, I wanted to go into a theoretical uh, question of how you uh, fix a, an issue where you cannot really address the problem without changing all the users, or rather the, the problem is not fixable without changing the API, which was not the case with GPIO, for, fortunately. With I2C it is. 
uh, it may be DSI in your case, uh, I, for, for, for all I know. I'm, I'm just thinking like, how do you approach it? Because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's gonna require much more effort and it will be much riskier because you will, if you start changing every provider, you start, you start you possibly introduce bugs and make them stop work and then, then you need to go one by one and ask the people who have the hardware to test it and uh, um, I, I'm, just, I'm just aware that this, this is one of the, one of the issues that uh, may arise when, when you try to fix it and uh, specific cases I squared C which you don't need but it may very well be the problem for, for any, anything else that you use and uh, You're right but then what do we do? I don't know, just do Go, go, go case by case and uh, fix it, I suppose. Or maybe you have a better solution, so I would love to, know, love to, love to hear it. Yes, yeah, so going case by case is what we are already uh, doing for the device tree removal itself, which is already raising lots of cases. Uh, so I think, uh, I don't see, I don't see a, a better approach. Uh, if there is one, I'd be glad to know, but uh, as, as Thomas said, we are not uh, having the need of removing an I2C adapter, mm -hmm. so we are lucky. Uh, at some point, someone will, and so someone will have to address that. Right. I think so. Okay. Um, any any other points? So, uh, when, although I didn't attend any DR talk, so when you say about removing devices. For, uh, via device tree, so is it about saving power or something like that, that you want to, yeah. Uh, no, the use case we have is uh, a, a physically removable uh, add-on, so that there is a main device which is standalone, it works standalone, and you can attach an add-on to provide more features. So via a connector that has an I2C bus and other stuff, So connects IQC clients, definitely, and other components, uh, some part of DRM, the DRM pipeline, and so on. So it's physically removing hardware. It's, it's something, it's, it's a use case that uh, I, I've seen already multiple times. You, ha you have like not a USB, which is made to be hot unpluggable, but something that is designed to be static like I2C, and then you have a GPIO. When you connect it, it goes high, and then the, the user space will know that, oh, someone connected something, so I need to act, and I need to see what's connected, read EEPROM memory, and see uh, what, what the thing is that's been connected. Like, a, imagine if BeagleBone han handled uh, dynamic capes, where you attach a cape, and it comes up and gets new functions, then you disconnect it, and, and it's gone, and it's handled gracefully. This is, uh, this is the thing, so yeah. like, Dynamic static buses. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's basically the, the beagle bone idea, but done at mm -hmm. one time. Yeah. Probably, probably my understanding of device tree has to evolve now. <laughs> because it, it has so, tree is so not yesterday the, the discussion that uh, Lucas started was about uh, how to handle device overlays at runtime and uh, how to describe such a connector in device tree, uh, in the static device tree part and in the overlay part, which uh, is actually quite an interesting problem. To... Actually, uh, when device tree started, it was like describe devices that are not dynamically detectable or not, not hot pluggable, basically. So that was my thinking, but yeah, these kind of scenarios are like hot pluggable, but yeah, we have the subsystems that work with the static and try to make them dynamic. It is a hard thing, yeah. I think the device tree is not about whether it's hot pluggable or not hot pluggable. It's about whether it's discoverable or not. And in our case, it's not discoverable, right? When with the hardware that's inside this add-on that Luca mentioned, is a bunch of uh, GSI bridges, i square set devices, whatnot, which are not discoverable. So the device tree is a relevant fit for that. Because device tree is not about whether it's hot pluggable or not hot pluggable. Really. So device tree is the limitation that then consider hot plug in the beginning. Right. Right. How much of your preferred solution could actually be pushed down into the driver car? So you're, you're number one. What, what huh. if any? 
That's yeah. That's a that's a good question. And uh, I mentioned during a talk at the last year's Linux Plumbers that I'm I'm thinking it's not even working on. I'm considering uh, a unified framework for provider consumer drivers or functions or something. Or, like yeah. That. So you would have a wrapper around your subsystem data and a wrapper around your driver data. And the entire thing with SRCU locking of API calls would be actually handled by that abstraction layer and not by each subsystem on, on, on its own. Because this is one of, I'm, I'm, I have a second talk about technical debt later in, in, the, in, in the afternoon. And uh, one of the things that I want to uh, touch upon is the fact that people come up with a, with a need to introduce a new subsystem and what they do, they just copy and paste something that's already existing, repeating the same mistakes, uh, introducing even in a more technical debt because then you have uh, the same the same functionality implemented over and over in every subsystem and I figured that the best approach would be to unify it. But the, making it uh, unified has its own problems because some subsystems will have much less strict requirements than others. And but you're making uh, an optional API, right? You're making additional functions somebody could use. You're not necessarily saying everybody must use these ones, right? No, here. no, no, of course so. not. So I, 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 I suggested it and I remember that uh, Greg Croa Hartman said that I should uh, take uh, three subsystems, the most, uh, that differ the most one from another and try to unify those. That if that happens, then you will, it will be much easier to, to prepare a unified interface for all of them because it's highly likely that if you get three very different cases right, then others will be, you know, uh, will be much easier. Yeah, please. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, so the three solutions, shall we say, um, I think they work okay for like the unbind solution, uh, the unbind case, but for like module unloading, if you don't have like a flag or like nulling out the implementation pointer in your in your solution, then you can still call into callbacks that are no longer in memory when you unload the, the modules. So I think like the third case for mm -hmm. uh, read-only config structures, which get decopied, but you can't really copy the text portions, right? No. You only so copy the function pointers, so that if you unload the module, and sure, all the devices get removed, but you might still have someone holding a reference to that provider and then does a callback, and then you call back, you call into something that is no longer there. No, so look at the bar flop here. So this function is not in the provider driver. Yes, it's I, in what I'm saying is your solution works, the other ones maybe don't. Ah. Right, yes, this is why it's so good. <laughs> I mean, maybe we'll not be able to unload the drivers because uh, if you have the owner field set and someone uses the driver, there's, you know, this try module gets, so you cannot unload the driver, basically. So the, the answer is, uh, no, it's still, it's still correct because what you should do, even if in, in the other two solutions, you should still be able to check that your device is still there. And this is still something that, like the NFC uh, problem. Like you may not need to do this whole SRCU stuff, but you still need to, when you enter your API function, take the read lock, check if the device is still there, then while still being sure that it will not go from under you, at least the pointer, like the physical device can be unplugged, but then the, the lower, lower level subsystem will handle that. You, you will call it, I don't know, some, you will send the USB request, it will come back uh, with an error. But at least the pointer will still be there and you, you are sure that it will stay until you release the read lock, after which you should not touch it because then it can be, it can be uh, unregistered and nulled. But with, with proper locking, I think this is something that, that, that is lacking from the majority of subsystems. Like uh, the I API calls may protect data, but they don't protect the device uh, from being unregistered. So. Yeah, we have one minute left. So, any any last points, remarks? Cool. So, thank you. <laughs>